So please uh, note your questions while Dr. Bindra delivers his lecture and uh, we will make it more interactive. Dr. Chandak, please guide us on the time. I hope we are not overshooting. We are okay. okay. Yeah, okay. Now, um, so while uh, he's getting set up, so these kind of fractures, Dr. Bindra, is it important that a uh, uh, hand-trained uh, orthopedic surgeon manages it or is it possible that a, a regular orthopedic surgeon can do it? What's your take on this? This is exactly what I was going to come to, that these cases that I'm going to show you are probably the most difficult, challenging cases that you can have. And I wouldn't recommend doing it unless you're used to handling screws 1.5, 2 millimeter in diameter. So it does require a certain level of expertise. Yes. Before if you're you an orthopedic surgeon and you like to swing hammers, etc., probably <laughs> don't do this. So one. an arthroplasty surgeon like me shouldn't no. venture into it. <laughs> <laughs> if your glove size is size 8.5 and bigger, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. In my <laughs> hospital, a pelvic surgeon wears nine size nine gloves. I so I tell him, don't come near the hand. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, as with any fracture, especially in the hand, when you have an articular fracture, the most important thing is to get alignment. And we saw that with the distal radius, right? You saw in the last case, great job getting the lunate back. Once you get the carpus aligned to the radius, the patient will do well. Little bit of articular step off doesn't matter too much because it's a non weight bearing joint. So the goal is you get it aligned and then you get it moving. And getting article alignment, in my mind, is the third in order of priority. It's not the first thing. It's the third thing. And the last thing is we have some great therapists who make our fair results into good results. If you don't have a therapist, it's really hard to do some complex cases like these, especially for hand surgery. So I'm putting up this case to give us some time to think about it. So this is a young boy. As it happens, he's your anesthetist son. So if you don't do it right for the rest of the year, your cases are going to go slow. <laughs> so you have to be careful. If at all, so, they anesthetize it. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so here is this fragment of bone sitting there. So here's this fragment of bone. And when we've reduced in the ED, They've sent it to my follow-up clinic two days later, and this fellow has got this piece of bone that's sitting out there. And it makes no sense because with a dorsal dislocation, you expect a small volar fragment. You don't expect a dorsal fragment. So we'll come to this. We'll come to this after understanding what happens with these fractures. So the first thing, when you're looking at an articular fracture, this is like the radius. You look at the x-ray carefully and try to figure where the fracture is coming from and CT scans. So we do CT scans for fingers as well, simply because it helps me plan my operation. The basic principles remain the same. Everything we use in articular fractures are only two things, lag screw or buttress plate, nothing fancy. Lag screw or buttress plate. The only key here in the hand is you need to know your anatomy. So it's like in the radius, you need to know all the different approaches in the hand, you need to know the volar approaches to the hand and I'll show you those today. You need to have plates that are this small if you're going to treat these fractures. And now, of course, we have the luxury of plates that are shaped like the fracture. So here is an example of a Rolando fracture, which is a comminuted fracture at the base of the thumb. Now, if you don't have access to expertise, the simple way of treating these is traction and a K-wire between the index and the thumb. So traction pronation of the thumb and 1K wire from the index to the thumb and that will hold it in distraction and your fracture is pretty well aligned. So if you don't have access to that, that's a good way to treat it. However, if you like to play with small screws and things, and you, so CT scan tells me I've got one piece, two piece and the shaft. So I can plan my surgery. So this is a Voler, the Geta moberg approach on the Voler aspect of the thumb. 
thinner muscles are elevated off the bone, and here's the dorsal fragment. APL tendon is inserting onto that dorsal fragment. So now what we've done is put a K-wire and fixed the articular portion of the fracture. Next, we put a plate on and we've put a wire fixing the shaft to the metathesis. Then we do a check x-ray. Now this is a special plate, it's been designed for these fractures with a hook at the bottom. So this is a copy, it's a miniature version of an olecranon plate. So like the olecranon plate sits on the triceps, this sits on the APL tendon that runs over here. Once we've got our fixation, it's very simple. We simply put neutralizing screws there and a lag screw across from here. There's a lag screw right here. So that gives you that added compression. Now this fracture looks a bit different, right? So if you look at it, it doesn't look like it's a, you can't understand whether this is an avulsion fragment or what's going on. But when you compare with the neighboring joints, you realize that the problem is not the fragment, the problem is the head is depressed. So this is one of the usual Friday night patients that we get involved in a fight, punch somebody and depress the head of the metacarpal. So this is a dorsal approach, right? This fracture will not be treatable by closed methods. You can pull it as long as you like, it's not going to be reduced. But this is easy because a dorsal approach, you make an incision, split the extensor tendon, open the capsule, there's a depressed fragment, put a freer elevator, pick up the bone like a ping pong ball, pick it up, close it back and put screws, lag screws across. And that's what it looks like. So a lot of these fractures are very simple. You just understand the fracture pattern and you treat it. Now this kid is playing rugby and he's pulled off his collateral ligaments because his fingers were pulled to the side. Now these collateral avulsions, if you look at it carefully, they're volar fragments. You see that? They're volar over there. So we use a little hook plate for that or you can just use a suture, pull through suture. But the trick for this is to go on the volar aspect rather than the dorsal aspect. So here's a volar approach. That's the flexor tendon sheath, and the neurovascular bundle is right here. So we're cutting on the bone sharply at the side of the flexor tendon sheath. Now you don't want to open the flexor tendons because you don't want them to get scarred down. So you elevate carefully the entire flexor tendon sheath off the bone. Once you've elevated that, now you're looking at your fracture right there. Now this is like doing a volar plate on the radius. You can't see the joint line. So you put your fixation and you get an x-ray to check your reduction. So here we are putting our hook plate in there. And that's what the x-ray looks like. So again, the CT scan tells you the fragment is volar. If you want to apply an AO principle, you got to go from the small fragment to the big fragment. And this is a very safe approach as long as you stay on the side of the flexor tendon and leave the tendon in the sheath. Now, if you look at this one, can anybody spot what's going on in this one? So he's gone to catch a cricket ball and he landed his hand against the ground. Anybody can see what's going on here? So ring metacarpal doesn't look normal, right? So there's a fracture right there. It's in the coronal plane. And what happens with these fractures is if you do a dorsal approach, you can't see the fragment because it's on the far side. Again, CT scan helps to explain to you, number one, where the fragment is. Number two, I know now the dorsal cortex is intact, so I can do lag screws. If the dorsal cortex was broken, then I would do a dorsal approach because I would work through the fracture. Because the dorsal cortex is intact, I have to go on a volar approach, right? So CT scan is really useful to plan your fixation and to plan your approach. 
So this is exactly the same approach we did in the previous case, where we elevated the flexor tendons. So flexor tendons are here in the, in the flexor sheet. This is the bare bone exposed right here. There's the metacarpal head. This is the depressed fragment here. So now we've hyperextended the finger so I can see the fracture line. And I'm putting two headless screws to stabilize that fracture. Right? So the concept again is small fragment to big fragment, lag screw. Here we're going through an articular surface, so we're using headless screws. These fractures are the most challenging, right? These are the base of the middle phalanx fracture where there's dorsal subluxation. So if you look at the axis here, this is off axis, correct? There's a couple of ways to treat this one. You can either treat them in a flexion splint and let them move, but they will end up with a flexion contracture. Or you can put an extension blocking K wire like this, right? Or you can use a, some kind of a traction device. What I find is, if you look at the CT scan on the cross section, there's depression in one corner, no depression there. So I find that if you don't correct the depression, when these people make a fist, the finger rotates because it falls into the depression area. So this is an open reduction of these fractures. This is probably the most technically difficult operation in hand surgery. So we do a volar uh, Brunner approach. Now in this case, we can open the flexor sheet because we are opening between A2 and A4. So you leave A2 and A4 intact, so you won't get bow stringing. So here we're elevating the flexor sheet. So now we're going to retract the FDP to one side, okay? Now the FDS is already has a natural split, so we make the split deeper. So if you make the split deeper down, you can now move one slip of FDS to one side and one to the other side. I'm going to cut the vincula so I get better access. Okay. So now we're looking at the volar plate over there, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to cut the collateral ligament on either side, the accessory collateral ligament. So we're going to cut the accessory collateral ligament. So I'm over here. This is the main collateral ligament. This is the accessory collateral ligament on the volar plate. So we're cutting this accessory collateral ligament right here. Now, we're going to elevate the fragments with the volar plate. So this is your fracture. These fragments that are broken are being retracted along with the volar plate off. So we can get to the depression area here. So that's the volar part being reflected. And now we are correcting the depression. Yep. Using the proximal phalanx as a template. Then we've restored the volar fragment back, put some K wires, and now we are putting a small buttress plate on the front. We take an x-ray because you can't see the reduction, right? This is like volar plating of radius. You can't see the reduction. So you take an x-ray. We're putting screws in there. Now the fracture is immediately stable because you've corrected the depression. Now we don't want the tendons to rub on the plate. So we take the A2, A4 pulley and we put it over the plate under the tendons. You see this? The patient is fully stable through a full range of motion. So now I'm pulling the tendon sheath over the plate, under the tendons. And we're going to stitch it down over there. So there's no metal work exposed to rub on the tendons. Patient is allowed to actively mobilize. 
We only give him a splint to stop him hyperextending, but they allowed full range of motion. So this is a dressing post-op, just a soft dressing so patient can actively start movement. And here is the patient three weeks later, and you can see he's already getting back his movement, and that's what the plate looks like. Now in this case, the fragment is lateral. So there's no need to go volar. You want to go lateral. So we put a plate on the lateral side through a mid-lateral approach. Okay? So the concept is, wherever the fragment is, you make a direct approach to the fragment. If it's volar, you go volar. If it's lateral, you go lateral. But you have to put either interfragmentary screws or buttress plate. If there's comminution, like there's some comminution, you put a buttress plate. If it's a clean break, you put interfragmentary screws. So we're coming back to this boy, right? This anesthetist son. Anybody can hazard a guess where this piece has come from? Even I wasn't sure when I did it. What do you think? So you're thinking some piece of bone from here? Okay. So... I wasn't sure how to approach it because I was like, do I have to do surgery on the volar side or do I have to do surgery on the dorsal side? I wasn't sure. The good news is he has torn this collateral ligament, right? Because he dislocated laterally and dorsally. So I made my skin incision on that side. And the moment I made the skin incision, the joint fell open because there was no collateral. So there's the collateral ligament completely off the bone on this side. So I could open it like a shotgun on the side. And you know what? That fragment was the articular surface of the middle phalanx. It was free floating under the extensor tendon. So when he dislocated, he sheared off the articular surface. He was 17. It was a growth plate that had just closed. So he almost did like a Salter Harris injury and ripped off that cartilage. So we put the cartilage back. It was only a piece of cartilage with a little bit of bone. A little bit of thukpati, stuck it back. You can't do that. You're wearing a mask, right? So, so you put some K wires. But what happens with these small fragments is when you reduce it, the articular pressure holds the piece back. It's like when we put that lunate piece back. You put it back in and you reduce the joint, it catches it. So once we put that in, we then put a bone anchor here and repair that collateral ligament back here, and that restored stability to the joint. So then we left those K wires coming out the back of the finger for three weeks. Then we pulled it out. And he was able to move through a limited range for the first three weeks. Then we took out the K wires. And he got back pretty good range of motion. So there's my incision on that side. So just to summarize it all, if you're dealing with articular fractures of the hand, your goal is to get the joint stable, number one. Number two, when you're looking at these fractures, Look at the x-ray carefully and try to figure out where those pieces of bone belong. Reduce it, get a post-reduction CT scan. So every patient with articular fracture, think of a post-reduction CT scan. Your approach should be direct so you can get the fragment. You don't want to go from behind and try to pull the fragment forward. You want to go to the fragment and push it down onto the intact bone. So you need to know your anatomy. But you need to have access to small plates and screws Otherwise, it's, it's a difficult procedure. And you need a good rehab team who understand what the injury is and how to rehab it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Any questions? We can take one or two questions. Yes, yes, yes Dr. Parag. Mike, use the mic. I would... Uh... Three questions, sir. In Metacup, Phalangeal joint, when we, exp uh, when we expose from the dorsal aspect, uh, the capsule is cut transversely or the extensor is cut longitudinally, like, and the capsule is cut transversely? Or no, I, I, I cut the capsule in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So it's cut dorsally in a straight line. And is there something like uh, for the capsule we use absorbable sutures or the same sutures like non absorbable pores below? I usually pores. don't repair it. Because the capsule only scars down. Mm -hmm. So I, I generally just repair the extensor tendon. I repair the extensor with non-absorbable ethibond. 
If I feel like repairing the capsule for some reason, you're right. I would use Vicryl. Yeah. Sir, uh, sorry for the mediocrity, but for uh, the lateral uh, corner fracture, couldn't it be uh, reduced close and then fixed with 0.8 millimeter K wires or 1 millimeter yes. K wires? Yes. Oh, for sure. I, it's not mediocrity. I think it's doing whatever works best in your hands, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, a fracture like this, you could put K wires, but the problem with K wires is you don't get compression and you can't move them early. Yeah. But it's perfectly reasonable to treat that fracture with percutaneous K wires, put them in a splint for three weeks, remove the K wires, and start mobilization. Perfectly reasonable. And third question, sir, for comminuted fracture of the base of the middle phalanx, actually at times we get one good uh, dorsal fragment also. We reduce it by whatever means. So these, these are the avulsion injuries of the central slip. Uh, out of fear of, you know, uh, re-injuring them, we immobilize them for a pretty long time. Like I immobilize them for six weeks and then I have to struggle for the mobilization. Yes. How much time will you immobilize them? Yeah. So the question was if you have a dorsal avulsion, right? Yes. Now, if it's a dorsal and a volar fragment, that is not an avulsion. That's what we call a peel-on fracture. Yeah. It's like the ankle. In a peel-on fracture, you cannot do the operation that I showed you. The operation I showed, the dorsal cortex has to be intact, right? You're using buttress principle. If dorsal is smashed, volar is smashed, you can't use the buttress principle, so you have to use ligament or taxis principle, so you put an external fixator, okay? If you have pure dorsal fragment, that's a central slip avulsion, right? Now in that one, if you keep it for six weeks straight, you're right, it's hard to get back flexion. So what you do is, for three weeks, you keep it straight, okay? The next three weeks, so there's a paper written by Wendell Merritt, M-E-R-I-T-T, W-Y-N-D-E-L-L, -L, Wendell Merritt. And what he has explained very cleverly is, you want to take the pressure of your central slip, right? And you can all do this. If you flex your MP joint down, right? And now you extend, your lateral band is extending your finger. Your central slip is actually relaxed. So for three weeks, you keep them still. And the next three weeks, your therapist will make them the Wendell Merritt splint, which they will bake for you after they read the paper. And the splint, it's something like this. It's like my pen. So the patient wears it in their hand, and they go to work. Okay? They're working, typing. And what happens is, because that finger is always held down, that central slip is detensioned. See? So you can use your hand and you can do everything with the splint in your hand like that. So the patients get the splint at week number three. So this has been something I've changed my management in the last three years. Mm -hmm. So now all our patients get this. The other terminology we use is called the relative motion splint. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you do an extensor tendon repair, you do the reverse like that. And the patient goes back to work, and the extensor tendon repair will not fail. So our extensor tendon repairs now are mobilized at three weeks, like this, with the reverse one. Yeah? So if it's an intrinsic, if it's a central slip, they're like this. If it's an extensor tendon repair, they're like this. But it's only a splint in the finger, and the patient can use the hand. So very user-friendly. Yeah, so uh, Parag. So one comment and one question. So, you know, we see a lot of these cricketing injuries who present to us with P2 bays, like your pylons, what you said, and they come in not necessarily on day one, day two. I do find that the Suzuki type frame is quite excellent for this kind of uh, the population. And even when they present late, you put the Suzuki frame and you get them going, eventually they get a good outcome. They may not fully extend, but they're very, very functional. Agreed. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a good bailout. Yes. And number two, I want to ask you, how do you tackle the RSDs which present. See, y'all are blessed with a good rehab uh, team and y'all are blessed with patients coming back on regular follow-ups. Often we see that patients don't keep to time here and they land up with RSD. So what is your approach to an RSD inflamed uh, hand and the wrist? So I try not to talk about these because I don't want referrals for <laughs> RSD. So I never give a talk on RSD if anybody ever asks me. So that's the first rule. So with these patients, you know, the problem with RSD is there's always a bit of a psychological going on, right? These are patients you can pick up at the very start. When they come to your office, they're crying with a finger injury and they're in tears. You know it's going to be a problem, right? 
So they need extra support. And so our, I often tell them, you know, you need a little bit of psychological help because this is getting you down. So they need psychological help. There's no question. And, and we start them on antidepressants, right? And if they have clear RSD where they have sympathetic overdrive, they're sweating, color changes, then I like the steroid ganglion blocks. So our pain clinic, pain management will do the steroid ganglion block. From, uh, yes. And from our perspective, from a surgeon perspective, all I tell them is you need an edema glove, you need lots of therapy, and we'll give you medication to help the pain, and the medication usually is an antidepressant. And then I tell them it's going to take you two years to get over it. The only surgery I do in an acute RSD patient is if they've got an ulnar nerve compression or median nerve, not ulnar nerve, median nerve compression. So I look for carpal tunnel. If they have carpal tunnel, tingling, swollen hand, I will do that, and that will sometimes help them. Or if it's a distal radius fracture, I look to see if there was a K-wire used and the radial nerve is trapped or if the ulnar dorsal sensory branch. If there is a clear nerve injury, then they get treatment for that. I may go and repair the nerve, wrap the nerve in fatty tissue or something like that. But if there's no nerve injury, then I just treat them with tender loving care, reassurance, and th that's about all you can do while the process calms itself down. You have any other tips on that? No, you know, there's some data supporting uh, high-dose vitamin C orally with a view towards bringing them out of RSD early and in prevention. Do they use that in your part of the world there? Or? So I, you know, I was uh, on that committee from AOS where we wrote the guidelines for distal radius. And we said everyone should be given vitamin C. And I've never given it. <laughs> but I've written the guidelines. The reason I've never given it, it doesn't seem to make a difference. And, and there is a, so there is a study by Eagle, Ken Eagle from New York. He did the study because two studies came from the Netherlands showing that vitamin C prevented reflex dystrophy. But Eagle showed that when they gave them vitamin C, they still had the same incidence of uh, uh, RSD, whether they got it or didn't get it. So it doesn't seem to matter. But I think in terms of placebo effect, it's great. Yeah. So you give them that, and you give them the paper saying vitamin C helps, and you're, they'll be happy. No, so understandably, RSD is an issue. You know, it's very difficult, as you you know summed it up in one line that you don't accept RSD talks. Yeah. But but uh, what other drugs? I know I've used vitamin C like you know every time. You know, I see a patient. You know, and uh, our hand surgeons also use it. But what other drugs? You know, other than you talked about a steroid block. What else medically, orally, yeah. in medicines? Another good drug to give them is uh, steroids, oral steroids. Okay. Okay. So one of the things we give them is called a Medrol dose pack. So it's Depomedrol. And it's, uh, I think it's like 300 milligrams in the first four days. It's like a full pack of 30 days. And that really cuts it out. The swelling comes down. Patient is well-being. Everything looks rosy for a month or so. So a steroid dose pack works very well. Another drug that's more popular now is Lyrica. I'm sure you get it yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the pharma pushes Lyrica pretty well. And it works. It works. So I started at nighttime, 25 milligrams, because some people get dizzy with it. Yeah. And then I increase it to 50 and then 75. And you keep them on that for six months or so. But do these patients eventually get better? Do they get a full functional range of motion? No, or no, no. no. So there will always be some deficit. Yes, yes. Ah. They invariably end up with, as long as they've been doing therapy, they're okay. But the ones who don't have therapy end up with fingers that are stiff. Yeah, yeah. And I have then done capsular release after two years. When the process is completely gone, then what we do is we admit them to hospital. Now in Australia, this is an off-label thing, but we give them IV ketamine. Okay. So if I'm doing an operation on someone with a prior RSD and I'm doing capsular release, they'll be admitted to hospital for three days and they get IV ketamine for those three days and they're completely high for three days. They're like totally <laughs> high. You, you just yeah, put them in yeah. bed and they're feeling euphoric yeah. and then they move it and then they go happy. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, any further comments? One last quick question, you know, and a quick answer. Uh, you said these patients have a psychological overlay, they have a functional overlay. So, my question is, does the RSD cause this functional overlay or is there functional overlay in the patients because of which they get RSD? I think it's the, it's the <laughs> if you read David Ring's work, right, yeah. David Ring is a hand surgeon who spends all his time now talking about psychology. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and what he says is, this, there's these patients who catastrophize. 
Okay. So they take this thing and it becomes a catastrophe for them. They could take a tennis elbow and make it a catastrophe. Mm. I can't work, I can't live, I can't do things. But so these patients who tend to catastrophize an injury are the ones who likely get the RSD. Oh, so there is a uh, link there. Definitely there is a link there. But what I tell the patient is the RSD is getting you down right. because they accept that much more easily. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely yeah. Okay, great. So, one last, so yeah. one last question. So what about hemi-hemate graft, autograft for the P2 fracture? So the hemi-hemate graft is something uh, I use when they have come 30 days plus. So if it's about a month old, like that patient I did there, if it was a month old and the fragments by then are totally resorbed, then I will use a hemi-hemate graft. So we take a piece of bone from the dorsum of the hemate and put it in there.